we have Mark Robertson, and he is representing um, Reborn C. The plastics industry has been established for around a century at this point, and they've received billions of dollars of revenue every single year. Now we're seeing a complete transition in their business model, and that stems from one major issue. We produce plastic so cheaply, so efficiently, that we produce plastic waste at an unprecedented rate. So this image may not look like much, but what if you were to multiply that volume times a thousand, or even a million? And that's the scale of the problem that we're dealing with today. Mountains of plastic waste like this are present all over the world. And this isn't even close to the 600 million tons of plastics we're producing every year. So these wastes, these wastes aren't providing benefit to anyone anymore. But what if I told you this was an excellent opportunity to generate profits? My name is Mark Robertson. I'm from Reborn C. I'm the co-founder and CTO. And we're leading the decarbonization market by reimagining what is possible with plastic waste. So in the past few years, we've seen a lot of exciting news in both sustainability and decarbonization. And that's what we like to call the modern gold rush. Specifically, we've seen billions of dollars of investments from large chemical companies like this one from Eastman. They just invested $1 billion into a single plastics recycling facility. This sort of spending is also backed up by huge federal investments. So just within the past few weeks, the Biden administration announced the largest investment into hydrogen production in American history. So this is $7 billion purely for research and development with the goal of stimulating this already rapidly growing market. The third point that I want to bring up is participation outside of the industrial sector. From this headline, you can see J.P. Morgan Chase spent $200 million on carbon dioxide removals, even though they're not emitters themselves. So this is showing us that CO2 emissions are seen as a commodity that can be bought and traded in the marketplace. So to wrap all of that together into a single sentence, any opportunity to decrease CO2 emissions is an opportunity for a company like us to profit. Specifically, we're talking about the industrial sector. These are the biggest portion of CO2 emissions, 40% of which come from industrial heating processes. So this industrial heating market is already enormous, uh, multi or above $100 billion, and they're looking for new technologies to help them become more energy efficient in their processes. But what's the actual problem here? If you think about the chemical industry, a lot of their processes require high temperatures, between 200 to 600 degrees C, and the only way of generating enough heat to achieve these temperatures is through the combustion of fossil fuels to heat water to then produce steam. And this can be really inefficient. That results in the combustion of more fossil fuels, higher CO2 emissions, as well as higher energy costs. A technology that's on the forefront of this transition to decarbonized heat are electrifying those heating processes. So what this is, is taking a material, can plug directly into that process, and then plug into a power source. That power source can then directly heat the material and essentially cut out the middleman of producing steam. That makes things much more efficient, reduces energy costs as well as CO2 emissions. And that's where we see that we can stake our claim in this modern gold rush. So think about the possibilities here. If we can provide this electrified heating process widespread throughout the industry, we can decrease energy costs, decrease CO2 emissions, and even provide additional revenue streams to things like carbon credits. And we do all of this using the, one of the most common precursors that's super cheap, and that's plastic waste. So we can take this plastic waste, grind it down into a material for 3D printing, and then shape it into whatever geometry we want, whatever geometry our customers want. And then we can take that material, derived from trash, and convert it into something really valuable. And that's carbon materials that can be used in that electrified heating process. So this can seem a little complex or advanced, but it's something that we're all familiar with namely through the filaments that are found in your electrical stove or oven. So this works in exactly the same way. It's a piece of metal that plugs into a power source and it heats up due to the, uh, the resistance of the material. Now there's one major difference between what you find in your stove and our materials, and that's energy consumption. Here I have a plot of the temperatures you can achieve in your stove based on how much of power you apply to that element. So you can see that they typically operate above 1,000 watts. If we see how our materials operate, you can see that we have the same exact temperature range at a fraction, an order of magnitude less of the power consumption. So think about all the energy we, we can save these companies. To look into that a little further, you see that we have excellent control of the temperature these materials output based on how much power we apply to it. And this is something that customers really love, so they can tune it directly to their process. 
To show you guys these materials in action, I just have two videos. The first one on the left is a piece of carbon that's been wrapped around a test tube filled with water. And when power is applied to it, <clears throat> you can see that it glows this orange color as it begins to heat up very quickly. That water boils within a matter of seconds, and then that uh, power can be removed, the heater cools down, and can be used over and over again. We can increase that application space by simply increasing the amount of power that we apply to the heater itself. So the video on the right is operating at 20 watts, which is essentially a fifth that of your common light bulb, but it's achieving temperatures above 600 degrees C and melting this piece of metal just within a matter of seconds. So that bright orange color is it achieving these really high temperatures, and then you see that piece of metal melt very quickly. Now these are really interesting characteristics for materials, and that allow us to enter uh, multiple different market segments. So specifically, we're looking at uh, plastics to fuel, carbon capture, specialty catalysts, and hydrogen production. And because our technology is so versatile, we see that we can tie all these together. But for entering the market, we're specifically targeting that hydrogen production. It's a rapidly growing market. These companies are um, uh, taking new technologies in, are very open to new technologies, and um, we have some promising results with our materials in this space already. To speak about our competitors in this field, uh, I want to bring up this plot. So the way that I want you to visualize this, when shapes come up, the farther they extend towards the outside of the circle, the closer they are to being as sustainable and as profitable as possible. So Total Energies has uh, technology that provide chemical stability as well as some energy savings, but they suffer from customizability as well as a large carbon footprint. Sabic has a similar technology, um, only increasing the available operating temperature. And then our main competitor, Topso, is one of the key players in hydrogen production around the world. They check some of these boxes, but uh, the processes to make their materials is really energy intensive, very expensive, and so that results in a large carbon footprint. When we look at our technology, we see that we check all these boxes only having a reduced operating temperature, but for the applications that we're investigating, our materials are well within the means. In terms of a business plan, one of the first things that we're doing is aggressively applying for federal non-dilutive funding. We've been uh, funded by the National Science Foundation in the past, and that's generally seen as favorable when you're applying for things like SBIR. We're developing sales contracts to provide solutions for heating and plas plastic waste management with these companies, ultimately moving towards licensing our technology whenever it's completely tailored to their process. Currently, we're working with um, a company specializing in catalysts, Evonik, and Sustion, who specializes in hydrogen production as well as CO2 capture, and they're working towards licensing our technology now. We just brought on board our newest customer, Polymer X, which is a startup focused on uh, developing aviation fuels from plastic waste. So with this business plan, <clears throat> we can draw out a three-year financial forecast. Within the next few months, we'll be able to start selling a minimum vital product minimum viable product in order to get revenues going early on. We'll be able to scale that production at the end of next year, and during this time period, we'll be rigorously testing our materials for hydrogen production so that we can provide our customers with a fully detailed picture when we launch that product. That would bring our uh, valley of death right around $400,000 to help fund that R&D process as well as onboard a dedicated CEO. As I mentioned, we're apl aggressively applying for those uh, federal non-dilutive funding opportunities, so we hope to minimize that value of death. We believe we're positioned to be some of the leaders in research development in the state of Mississippi and that we have the right team to do it. Our founder and president, Dr. Judge Chung, is a rising star in the field of polymer science and engineering. He just was recently recognized by Forbes for 30 Under 30 in science and has many other awards that exemplify his expertise in this area. Myself, again, I'm Mark Robertson, co-founder and CTO of Reborn C. Um, I've had a very successful graduate school career studying polymer science and engineering, and I'm very well recognized in my field. And I'm excited to step into this space um, as an entrepreneur. Now, just to share some quick news before I wrap up that's pretty exciting. Uh, we were just recognized at one of the premier uh, expos for composites and advanced materials in the world as leaders in material and process innovation. In this competition, we were uh, competing against companies like Spirit Aerosystems, GE, Taijin, and Henkel. And this really illustrates that even though we're a startup, we can, com we can be competitive at this international level with these large corporations. So to leave you with a few words, decarbonization is profitability, and Reborn C is leading the way to electrify our future. Thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions.
So in terms of lifespan, uh, they can cycle continuous, continuously as many times as we want. We haven't seen any decay in performance. And that's something that we're interested in investigating, like how we could incorporate those into more residential type applications, like something we've talked about is just like an on-demand heater for boiling water or something that you could do portably. Um, that isn't something that we've completely fleshed out as of now, but it's something that we're interested in investigating into the future. Pardon me? Uh, durable in terms of what, uh, mechanically? Physically uh, durable in terms of strong by touch. Uh, like if you were to put a ton of weight on it, it would crumble. But uh, it, for the applications that we're looking into, it's perfectly durable. It can ship. You can move it around, toss it around, and it won't break or anything like that. So perfectly durable, but not something for high strength applications like, a, like an airplane, for instance. Yeah, so those two companies that I brought up earlier, um, Evonik works in catalysts, so they're really interested in our materials for catalyst supports for different chemical reactions in the industry. And then Sustion's the other one. Uh, they're relatively new. They work in both hydrogen production and carbon capture. So they're really interested in how our materials can do that electrified heating process to regenerate the material for those applications, and they're, they're interested so far. Uh, that's exactly what the goal is here to yeah see if it can be used in those induction heating processes specifically we're looking more chemically for induction heating so like to provide induction heating during those chemical reactions but it has a lot of applications in that space Right, so that's our goal. Since we can 3D print these materials, we can essentially make whatever the customer wants uh, and drop it directly into their process, just taking out their conventional system, essentially. Can you repeat that? I'm sorry. I would say yes. I'd, I. We've never tested it, so I can't say beyond a shadow of a doubt, but I would say yes. There, there's no difference in how the material operates, and carbon itself is a very safe material, um, so I would say yes. So in terms of the materials themselves, in the production side, when we're converting them to carbon, all the things that come off are already established in the industry for removal. So things like socks and so on, SOXs, uh, sulfur-containing gases, those can be removed. They're established systems in the industry already. So from that, that would be the m most major concern, is just scrubbing the gases from the process streams. But that's something that's established. Yes, sir. So in our final materials, they're completely converted into carbon, and carbon is super thermally stable. It can last multiple cycles at 600 degrees C um, without degrading. If we were to go above that, it would start degrading and performance would, te would deteriorate, but they're super stable at even those very high temperatures. That's a good question. Um, not 600 million tons every year, but I think, so currently 
Recycling methodologies are really bad. We, there's no way to do this, essentially. So I think that by incorporating this sort of design, we can take out a substantial chunk and definitely assist in those uh, like conventional mechanical recycling technologies. That's a good question. So um, there are a lot of like municipal recycling facilities nearby. Uh, not a lot, but there are a few. And so uh, that's something that we can purchase pretty cheaply from uh, those places. But we can also do it without plastics or without recycled plastics if we need to, like just commodity plastics that works in the same way. There's Our process sees no difference between a recycled plastic and a neat uh, new plastic. So resourcing materials wouldn't be an issue, but there's a lot of opportunity to source those materials from different municipal recycling facilities. So our process works on a portion of the plastics that are already separated by conventional recycling facilities. So essentially they can take what they've already done in their process and just give us that product and we can use it directly. In the back, yes, sir. The crystalline structure. So um, these materials aren't incredibly crystalline. It, it's amorphous carbon. Um, if that answers your question, yes, sir. Ten seconds. All right. Thank you, everybody. Um, if anyone's interested, come find us later.